All right, Chemistry 3101. Where we left off last class was looking at Chapter 5, and we did a little introduction to Chapter 5. So I'm just going to review a couple of the concepts with you here. We talked about what isomers are. Isomers are compounds that have the same formula. And then I said there's uh, two types of isomers that we're going to be concerned with. As chemists, one is constitutional isomers. That's something that you would have covered in general chemistry one. You see this molecular formula here down in the bottom left, C2H6O. Um, there's two different ways you can connect these atoms. You could either make ethanol, which is the alcohol that's found in alcoholic beverages, or you could make this compound dimethyl ether, which is used as a propellant in aerosol cans, like hairspray or whipped cream or whatever. Um, and so these compounds have the same formula, but the atoms are connected in a different fashion, okay? So the, uh, the order of connectivity of atoms is different, okay, between the two. Now, if we move over to stereoisomers, which is going to be the focus of chapter five, okay, um, now we're looking at um, isomers that have the same molecular formula, of course, the same constitution, right? But they have the same connectivity, right? The atoms are connected in the exact same way. The only thing that differs between stereoisomers is the orientation of the atoms in space, okay? And if you're, if you're confused about that or if you don't remember that, well, I said that cis and trans would be examples of stereoisomers, right? If you look at cis 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexene or trans 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexene, if we look at the structure as a bond line structure like this, you can see that the atoms are connected in the exact same way. We have a six-membered ring, and then we have two methyl groups on adjacent carbons. The difference between these two molecules is the orientation of the atoms in space. On one molecule, the two methyl groups are on the same side of the ring, and on the other one, they're on opposite sides of the ring. So cis and trans are stereoisomers. Again, the same connectivity, but different arrangements or orientations of the atoms in space. So cis and trans is one type of isomerism, but if you remember when we talked about alkenes last class, I said, well, there's another type of cis-trans isomerism that exists in double bonds. Okay, we first learned it in a ring, but it also can exist in a double bond. So if you have an alkene, and that's a functional group you should know. So if you have a carbon-carbon double bond, and if you have two groups that are identical on the same side of the double bond, that's called a cis-alkene. And if they're on opposite sides of the double bond, we call that a trans-alkene. So again, you can see that these two molecules, cis-2-butene um, and trans-2-butene, they both have the ex exact same connectivity. We have a methyl group, a methine, a double bond, a methine, and a methyl group. So the connectivity is identical between the two. What's the difference? It's the orientation of the atoms in space, and therefore these would be considered to be stereoisomers. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this problem. It's Thursday, so it means it's time to look at this. And we have a few pairs of compounds here. We have um, one, two, three, four, and then we have five. Oops, maybe I can draw a better line with that. Anyhow, we have five pairs of compounds here, and we wanted to determine are these pairs constitutional isomers, stereoisomers, or identical? So we'll start with the one in the top left here, the one I have this red circle around. Could anybody tell me, how would you classify these? Are these identical constitutional isomers or stereoisomers? Yeah, exactly. These two compounds are identical, aren't they? Right? They're identical. Why? All they are is a six-membered ring, a cyclohexane ring with an, a hydroxyl group on it. That's all it is. It's just, we call this compound cyclohexanol. So there's no differentiation between these two. The only difference is that somebody flipped the ring, right? We have a ring flip and it's going to lie more to this side than this side, right? Because here this, the hydroxyl group is um, equatorial as opposed to axial. All right, let's move over to the next one. So we'll go over to the right here. How would you describe these two? <clears throat> Excuse me. These two would be identical again, right? These two would be the exact same, right? Thanks, Sean. Absolutely. There's no difference between these two. So for the first one, we'll put identical. And for this one over here, these are also identical. Okay. If you were to take this molecule and flip it on this axis here, flip it 180 degrees like a pancake, okay, you would end up with the exact same compound. And so these two compounds are identical. What about these two down here that I have in this red circle? How would you describe those?
Yes, absolutely. These are stereoisomers, aren't they? So let's pencil that in here. Stereo isomers. Now, how did you know that, Sarah? Well, the reason that she knew that is because you have a six-membered ring, and then you have one, two hydroxyl groups attached to it, right, on both of these. But on one of them, the two hydroxyl groups are, are cis, and on the other one, the two hydroxyl groups are trans. <clears throat> Therefore, these two compounds would be stereoisomers. Anybody have an idea about this one over here, these two alkenes? How would you describe these two? They're not identical, I wouldn't say that, okay? Because if you look at the connectivity of each, you have a CH3 group, then you have a CH, then you have a double bond, then you have another CH, then a CH2, then a CH3. But what you have to remember is that there's no rotation around a pi bond. And so they have the same connectivity, but in this one, my two hydrogens are trans to each other. And here, my two hydrogens are cis to each other. And so these two compounds would be stereoisomers. So let's pencil that down. These are stereoisomers, like that. And the last two compounds, those are just constitutional isomers, right? You can see one's a ketone, one's an ether. So they're definitely not stereoisomers. Um, so these would just be constitutional isomers. So constitutional isomers and both of these both are um, c4 eight no sorry c5 uh one two three four yeah c4 c4 h one two three four five six c8 son of a gun h8 oh there you go i think i need more coffee there we go so they both have the same molecular formula I need to fix something in my notes here i just noticed that i'd written that down incorrectly. All right, with that in mind, let's turn our attention to the next problem. It says, identify the following compounds. Is cis, trans, or neither? I think we kind of answered these already, but if we look at this one here again, since we have two hydrogens that are on the same side of this double bond, that makes this a cis compound. If we go to this alcohol over here, we have one alcohol going up, one alcohol going down, right? You could also represent that like this, where you have one alcohol group going up and one alcohol group going down like this. So that makes this a trans compound. If we look over here, both hydroxyls are pointing up, right? One is up and equatorial and the other one is up and axial. So if they're both pointing up, right? That means they're cis to each other. So this is a cis compound. This one, we already looked at it. You have a hydrogen going up like this, a hydrogen coming down like this. Oops, pretty that up. There we go, so this is a trans compound. And then here, could anybody identify this compound as being cis or trans? The last one. I didn't address this one in the last problem. Yeah, so this one's a, kind of an interesting situation, right? You've got a methyl group that's trans to this methyl group, but then that methyl group here is cis to this methyl group. So the answer for this one is neither, okay? It's neither, and I'm gonna go over the definition, neither. Um, whenever you have two groups that are identical on the same carbon of a double bond, it can't be cis or trans. It's impossible to have cis or trans, right? Because if you had another group that's identical, well, it's going to be trans to one and cis to the other. So there's no such thing or cis or trans. Again, when you have two groups that are identical on the same carbon of a double bond. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on cis and trans. Stereoisomers, constitutional isomers. Yes, identical compounds. Good, good. So then we started looking at chiral objects. And then we said, well, let's take that chiral object idea and let's extrapolate it to molecules. And we said, if you have a carbon atom, that's attached to four different groups. We call that a chiral carbon or a chiral center. So this, where I have this little star here, we call this a chiral center. You can also call it a chirality center, chi chirality center. You can call it a stereocenter, stereo center. 
You can call it an asymmetric center. You can call it a stereogenic center. There's a whole bunch of names that we have for the same thing. I know you might find that annoying. That is just the way it works in organic chemistry. There's a few different names we give to those chiral carbons. I'll try to stick with the simplest terminology. So we get some practice on identifying the four different groups attached to a carbon, which renders it a stereo center. And remember, it's four different groups. It's not four different atoms, but four different groups. So we covered that. And that brings us to this problem here, which asks us, okay, now that you've identified a chirality center as a carbon that is attached to four different groups, could you identify a chirality center in these molecules? So the way that I think we should do this, give me a second. The way I think we should do this is I'm going to highlight a carbon like this one here. Okay, see this carbon that I highlighted in green? Could anybody tell me, and it's not a trick question, we're just kind of fleshing the idea out here. Is this a stereocenter? This green carbon? No, it's impossible, right? Why is that impossible? It can't be a stereocenter, right? Because it's a CH2. It's attached to two hydrogens. They're identical, so it's not a stereocenter. Okay, thanks. What if I highlight this carbon in yellow? Would that be considered to be a stereocenter? I'm going to erase the other scratch that I put in here. Is that a stereocenter? The answer is also no. Yes, my students are all correct. This is not a stereocenter. And if you're sitting there going, well, it looks like a stereo center to me. Well, let's look very careful. Carefully. It's not because two carbons. It's two. Gr it's groups. OK, it's not about atoms. It's about groups. So let's study the groups. We have a hydroxyl. That's group number one. We have a hydrogen. That's group number two. Here we have a methylene. Here we have a methylene. So we still haven't found any difference. Let's keep going until we find a difference. Then we have another methylene. Then we have another methylene. Still no difference, so we keep going. Then we come down to the end of the molecule. I'm going to write this in green. And we have another methylene here. And so the path going from the from the carbon highlighted in yellow, going counterclockwise or clock, or sorry, clockwise or counterclockwise, either way, it's the same path. And therefore, there's no difference between the two groups that are attached uh, through the ring. And so it's not a chiral center. All right, there we go. G give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Not a chiral center in this case. Ch All right, cool, cool. Okay, so if I highlight, I'll highlight this carbon in red. Okay, we'll try that. If, what about this carbon in red? Would that be a stereo center? Would you call that a stereo center? Is it attached to four different groups? All right, I say yes, it's, it's a beautiful stereo center. Now, if you're, if you're confused and like, oh, it looks like there might be symmetry in there, I'm not sure. Okay, let's, let's look at it very carefully, okay? So, remember that there's a hydrogen that's coming down an equatorial. Okay, so we'll pencil that in. So look, we've got one group for the hydroxyl, two groups for the hydrogen. Now let's look at this carbon. The carbon that's attached over here, that's a methylene. And then this carbon here, I'm going to do it in black. This is a carbon with one hydrogen and a hydroxyl attached to it. This group here is very different than a CH2 group, a methylene. So this carbon highlighted in red is attached to four different substituents. Do you see it now that it's attached to four different groups? Okay. It is definitely attached to four different groups. Remember, it's not atoms. It's four different groups. Okay, so with that in mind, now that we've identified that one, a little bit tricky, right? It takes some practice. So based off of that rationale, if I highlight this carbon in blue, would the carbon in blue be, be a stereocenter? Go with your gut. If the one in red was a stereocenter, what about the one in blue? It has to be a stereocenter. Absolutely, right? And, and in case you, you didn't get it, I, all my students put the right answer in the, in the chat. So look, let's check. What's up with that hydrogen? That doesn't look pretty. Okay, there we go. So look, we've got one group, two groups, three groups. This is a methylene. And I'm sorry, but this is not a methylene. That's not a CH2, man. So clearly we have four different groups here. And so the carbon highlighted in blue is also a stereocenter. So the answer is in this compound, we have two stereocenters, two stereocenters. It does take some practice to identify them, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. All right. So let's just write here no chiral centers for this one. And we'll put, put this one, this one, we'll put chiral, chiral centers. Or if you wrote stereo centers, that's totally fine too. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit here. What about if I highlight this carbon in blue? Would that be a stereo center? Is it attached to four different groups? Okay, let's check. So it's attached to a hydrogen, which is in the back. Right, this is a methyl group. So we've got a hydrogen, we've got a methyl group, we've got an ethyl group, and then we've got this giant group over here. So those are four different groups. So the carbon highlighted in blue is definitely a stereo center. Right, definitely a stereo center. Now, if we look at the next carbon, I'll highlight it in red like that. This would also be a stereo center. Why is it a stereo center? Let's check. The hydrogen is not shown. I'll, I'll pencil it in here. It's going to look something like this. So let's check. We've got one, two, three, four groups. Right? The groups in the big circles, one's a sec butyl, one's an isopropyl. Those are two different groups. And so that would be a chiral carbon. Yes, absolutely. OK, I'm going to ask you one more question. What about this one in yellow? Is that a stereo center? Is the one in yellow a stereo center? No, not a stereo center. Stereo center, right? Because you have two methyl groups attached to it. So there you go. It's not a stereo center. All right. So these two here, we'll put here chiral. Okay. Is there another question? Yeah, there's one more. I'll just kind of go over this one with you quickly. We have two stereo centers, one here and one here, okay? And I'll let you identify that in your own time. So somebody says, when referring to groups, is it only functional groups or is it anything attached to the carbon, no matter how small? Sarah, there's a difference between groups and functional groups, okay? Two different things. So yes, it's just whatever group is attached. It's not talking about a functional group. Okay, an ethyl group would be a, a group, okay? Uh, or isopropyl, whatever it is, okay? So let's just do one more, Sarah. Let's say you had this chiral carbon here, right? This is a group, this is a group, this is a group, and all that's a group, okay? There's only one functional group in the compound, which is the, which is the double bond. But functional group and group, two different things. All right, there we go. All right, beautiful. Two stereo, so we'll put here, zoink, there we go. We'll put here chiro. Okay, beauty, we're cooking with gas now. Then it says, oh, good gravy, identify, identify all the chiral centers in vitamin D3. This is a tough question to do uh, remotely with my students, you know, over the chat here. Let me just highlight a carbon. Would this one be a chiral carbon? This one that I have highlighted in red, vitamin D? Yeah, so that one would be a stereo center. Yes, absolutely, right? So if we look... Okay, it's attached to a hydroxyl, oops, a hydroxyl, so it's a hydroxyl, a hydrogen, and here we have a CH2 with a CH2 attached to it, and here we have a CH2 with a, a, a quaternary carbon attached to it. So you can see that the two things that I have in the long ovals are two different groups, right? Again, CH2, but you keep looking until you find a point of difference, CH2. And then here we have a carbon with no hydrogens attached. So those are two different groups. All right. So in the interest of time, instead of me, you know, spending a lot of valuable time here going over every single stereo center, I'll just highlight them all for you. So I'll highlight them all in yellow. Maybe I'll do that. I lost my hydrogen in the process. There we go. All right. So we've got one here. We have one here, 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 here. I think that's it. Yeah, that, that would be all of them. Anyhow, something that's kind of interesting about this, and I think it comes up in the notes a little bit, is in vitamin D, we have five chiral centers, five chiral centers. So if you're wondering about the number of possible stereoisomers that could happen, so we'll put down here, number of stereoisomers, stereoisomers is equal to two to the power of N, where N is equal to number of, Chiral centers, chiral centers, 
And so for vitamin D, you would have two to the power of five, which is equal to 32. So you'd have 32 different stereoisomers for vitamin D. So it makes you, you know, have a lot of respect for nature and its ability to make one specific stereoisomer. Anyhow, let's move on from there. We covered last class what enantiomers were. They're non-superimposable mirror images. And just like the two human hands, right? If you put up your left hand, oh, good gravy, don't ask me to draw anything, okay? There's your left hand, and here's your right hand. That's actually not my worst work ever, you know? And yeah, if you look at the left hand and the right hand, they're mirror images of each other, but you can clearly see that you cannot superimpose one on top of the other. They don't match, right? So they look identical, but they aren't identical. And so we said, okay, when you have two enantiomers, how do you draw, or if you have one chiral you know, molecule, like this molecule here, this is chiral, there's my pen, this is a chiral molecule, because <clears throat> this carbon is attached to four groups, well, how do you draw the enantiomer? Well, you could either try to craftily draw uh, the enantiomer like this, like try to draw the mirror image, or you can just take any wedge and flip it to a dash, and any dash and flip it to a wedge, and just like that, you've drawn, um, you've drawn the uh, enantiomer. All right, so we said, okay, well, the two in the blue boxes here, all they did was invert a stereocenter, and they made uh, the enantiomer. So in case you don't recognize this molecule here, this is, this is amphetamine. So if you put a methyl group on there, you get crystal meth, all right, methamphetamine. Anyhow, that's not the topic of today's lecture. I'll teach you how to synthesize meth at a later date. Okay, so that brings us to uh, what we call the Kahn Ingold prelog rules. Okay, or the Kahn Ingold prelog system, CIP, which is, you know, let's say you have these two compounds here. These two compounds are enantiomers. Okay, so enantiomers. And how do you differentiate between the two of them? Right, if I just gave you a compound like this, if I didn't tell you this was a stereocenter, you would call this compound 2 chloro chlorobutane. Okay, but if I show you what the chirality is, if I put the chlorine on a dash or a wedge, well, in that case, I'm indicating which enantiomer you're looking at and how do you differentiate between the two. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to a blank document here and we're going to practice this. Just let me find a, some blank space here and we're going to give this one the old college try by ourselves here and I'm going to try and teach you without using my notes. Right? just using Mr. Dion's wits, okay? So let's see what we can do here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna designate any chiral carbon, it's either gonna be, it's gonna have what we call R stereochemistry or S stereochemistry. So these are opposites. It's either R or S. Any stereocenter is either designated as R or S. So that means that this compound would be called R2-chlorobutane or S2-chlorobutane. It's our job to figure out which one is it. Is it R or is it S? So what we're gonna do is drag it down here and I'm gonna teach you the rules for de determining whether a chiral center is given the R designation or the S de designation. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to want to probably draw in any hydrogens that are missing. This is usually useful. Then, do you have a periodic table with you? I hope you do. Whenever you're studying chemistry, you should have a periodic table. Mine's a little buried here, uh, my periodic table of the elements, but you should always have a periodic table with you. And you, what you do is you prioritize the groups based on atomic number, okay? Could anybody tell me if this is a chiral carbon, and it is, um, if I designate, or I say this is a group, right? Chlorine is a group, hydrogen is a group, okay? Then I have a carbon over here and a carbon over here. Maybe I'll put this one in black and I'll put their blue and I'll put this one in black. But anyhow, if I look at um, these four atoms, the two carbons are obviously identic identical. Their atomic number is six for both of them. Could anybody tell me which atom here has the highest atomic number? And this is probably one you know off by heart. It's the chlorine, right? Yeah, exactly. Chlorine is element number 17. And so what we do is we prioritize the atoms in order of atomic number. So that means that chlorine is gonna get number one. If you have a hydrogen, 
Hydrogen has the lowest atomic number in the entire periodic table, so it's always given number four, okay? So now we need to differentiate between these two carbons, okay? Now, carbon has an atomic number of six, so how do, how do we differentiate? We keep going away from the chiral center until we find a point of difference. So what is this carbon attached to as you go away from the chiral center? It's attached to a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. Are you with me on that? Three hydrogens. That's Remember, we're going away from the chiral center, okay? So it's attached to three hydrogens. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write a little list here. I'm just going to put an arrow here and say this carbon is attached to a hydrogen, hydrogen, and a hydrogen. One, two, three, one on top of each other. And if it's a different atom, then I put the highest atomic number first. Okay, so if I look at this carbon atom, what's it attached to? It's attached to a carbon atom that's here. It's also attached to a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. Right? We're going away. What three things is it attached to directly? Well, we would say it's attached to, it's attached to a carbon, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. We're going away from the stereo center. Remember, carbon has four bonds. So what are the three things it's attached to, right? That going away from the chiral center. If you go towards the chiral center, then you have the chiral center, but we're going away from it. So we have a carbon, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. Well, where's the tiebreaker? You can see that here you have a carbon which has a higher priority than a measly old hydrogen. And so we assign this group number two, I'll use my blue pen, we give this, son of a gun, we give this group number two, and then this is gonna be group number three, okay? Now, since the hydrogen is in the back, okay? So lowest, we'll put here lowest priority, priority, group, which isn't always a hydrogen, it oftentimes is, is in the back, okay? Then what we do is we take and we draw a circle going from number one to number two to number three, going around the chiral center. So there's the chiral center. So we're gonna go from one to two to three, okay? We drew a circle and we went around like this. So, which direction was I going? Was that clockwise or counterclockwise? Which direction is my circle going with my arrow? No. No, a clock, right? If you have a clock, right? A clock goes like this, right? So that would be clockwise, right? Exactly. So if it's clockwise, it's given an R designation. And if it's going counterclockwise, it's given an S designation. And so the name of this compound would be R2-chlorobutane. All right, somebody asked a question. It says, why is there not a carbon on the number three group? The reason there's no carbon on the number three group is because this is a methyl group, DH3. Right, and we only list the things that are attached going away from the stereo center. Yes, I know there's a carbon there, but that's that's heading backwards. That's going back towards the chiral center. We want to go away from the chiral center. So that carbon. So again, if it's a methyl group, it's attached to a hydrogen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Does that make sense? Does that clear it up a little bit? We're, we when we're making that list of three things, we go away from the chiral center, All right? Carbon has four bonds, but the last one is, right, there's gonna be one that's going backwards, right, but you go forwards. Good, awesome, okay. So there's the rules for the Kahn-Ingold prelog system. So what do you do if you have a situation like this, okay, where the lowest priority group is coming out in front of you like this? Okay, so now it's reversed. And obviously, you know, if the first one was R, the next one must be S, you're, and you're right. Okay, but let me just go over it with you quickly. We said that this was group number one, this is group number four, this is group number two, and this is group number three. So what you do is you trace and you go one, two, three, and it's still clockwise. But when the lowest priority group, so lowest priority, priority group, uh, is in front um what you do is if it's clockwise you if it's r right because now it looks like it's an r designation you flip it to s 
And if it was S, you flip it to R. So you basically read it and you designate a desire and you say, well, the lowest priority group was coming out in front. So you reverse the stereochemistry. So lowest priority group is in front, reverse, reverse stereochemistry, stereochemistry. And if you're like, what does that mean? Reverse stereochemistry. It means if it's R, flip it to S. If it's S, you flip it to R. So it's R. So that means it's S since the lowest priority group is reversed. And so this compound would be S2 chloro butane like that. Give me a thumbs up if that makes some sense. If the lowest priority group is coming towards you, you reverse it. If the lowest priority group is going in back, you read it the way it's it's shown. Okay, let's try let's try one together then. What if I gave you something like this? Okay, if I gave you something that looks like this. Okay, there's one chiral center in this molecule. It's this carbon right here, and we want to designate this carbon as R or S. Okay, I'll do one more example. I'll just do this one and then I'll go back to my notes. All right, so here's what we do. We're going to draw the hydrogen, right? Because it's not shown in a bond line structure. We know the oxygen must be number one. The hydrogen must be number four, right? Oxygen has a higher atomic number than anything else in here, which is just carbon and hydrogen. Hydrogen has the lowest number in the periodic table. So then what we do is we're going to go to this carbon. We go away from the chiral center. Could anybody tell me what three atoms this carbon is attached to going away from the chiral center? Away from the chiral center. Do not go back towards the carbon. It's attached to two hydrogens and what else? It's attached to three things. Carbon always has four bonds. Two hydrogens and a carbon, right? It's attached to this carbon and these two hydrogens, right? This is going away from the chiral center. This is going away from the chiral center. And this is going away from the chiral center. If you went to this carbon, it would be going backwards. So this carbon is attached to, list them in order, it's attached to a carbon, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Now, what about this carbon over here? We'll label it in red. It's attached to one hydrogen, but when you have a double bond, you count each one of those as a single bond to this carbon here. So you'd list this as carbon, carbon, hydrogen. Again, two uh, bonds, right? Carbon one, carbon two. So you put carbon one, carbon two, like that. So it's attached to CCH. So where's the tiebreaker? Here's the tiebreaker right there, right? The first one doesn't break the tie, but the second one does. And so that means that this group would be assigned number two, and this group would be assigned number three. Now, could anybody tell me, is this R or S? this compound. It would be R, right? Thanks, Anna, right? Because you go from one to two to three, which is clockwise. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. So this is clockwise. Therefore, it's R. It's an R compound. All right, there you go. So a little introduction to the con angle pre-log rules. Let's go back to the slides. And you can see there's a bunch of information in here in my slides and it explains the rules okay so what what did we do okay the rules were this let's just review number one we used atomic numbers to prior prioritize the four groups attached to the chirality center then we arranged the molecule now it says here arrange the molecule so that the lowest priority group faces away from you i don't like this i didn't even do this okay i'll put a little question mark by this i like to if the lowest priority group is coming towards you I would just reverse the stereochemistry. It's much easier than doing this. Then you count one, two, three. If it's clockwise, it's R. If it's counterclockwise, it's S. But that's if the lowest group is facing away from you. If it's coming towards you, you reverse it. Okay? That's all there is to it. And it even says here in the book, where is it here? It says, and this is notes from the author of the textbook. He says this whole manipulating the molecule thing that they tell you to do in the book, it leads to too many errors. So the, even the author of the textbook says, don't do that. If group number four is in the front, you just reverse the final configuration. Like I said, if it's S, it's R. If it's R, it's S. So let's go back here to this compound. Where was it? The compound they started with. And could anybody tell me, is this compound here, is it an R compound or an S compound? The one that's shown here. I'll give you a second to look at it. All right. I like the way my students think. So this is an S compound, right? If we go from one to two to three, we're going clockwise. 
which would be R, but the lowest priority group is coming towards you, not going in the back, coming towards, uh, we'll put coming towards viewer. Therefore, it goes from R to S. It's an S compound. All right, if the lowest priority group is coming towards you, you reverse the, chemist, the stereochemistry. If it's in the back, you take it the way it's written. All right, let's take a look at another one here. It goes over how to re rotate the molecule. And I've already gone over this thing here, the whole tiebreaker situation. I just covered this with you in detail. So I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, I went over double bonds and how they work. So we've covered that. So with that in mind, let's see if we can solve this stereo center here. Okay. So another little trick that I'll teach you is if you just have a straight carbon chain, like here we have CH3, here we have CH2, CH3, here we have CH2, 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 CH3. So this rule only works for straight chains. It doesn't work for branched um, alkyl groups. But if you have a methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, you prioritize them in order of the longest chain. The longest chain always gets the higher priority. So if you look at the chiral carbon, this carbon here, okay, this group here is going to be carbon number one or group number one. How do I know it? Because it's the only one that has oxygen in it, right? This carbon is attached to oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. Well, none of the other carbons are attached to oxygen. So this is going to be group number one. This would be group number um, two. This would be group number three. And then this would be group number four, which is coming towards you uh, like that. So the lowest group is coming towards you. So could anybody designate this stereo center as R or S? I'll give you a second to think about it. Remember, you draw the circle around the chiral center. So look, we start on group number one. So we start on number one. This is where we start our footprint. And we have to go around the chiral center. You can't go from one to two to three. No, you have to go around the chiral center from one to two to three. So that's clockwise, which would suggest that it's R, but the lowest priority group is coming towards you, towards, therefore you have to re re uh, reverse it. So it's an S compound. All righty. <laughs> There we go. Now there's all kinds of little tricks about rotating the molecule. Just the only one that I'm gonna go over with you right now is that if you reverse two groups, if you switch two groups, you switch the stereochemistry from R to S or S to R. And the re reason I bring that up is one of my students brought that up to me when he was studying for the MCAT. He said, hey, Mr. Dion, did you know that if you swap two groups, it um, reverses the stereochemistry? And I said, yeah, I did know that. I taught it to you in class. Anyhow, um, somebody says the total Molecular mass of the second group is greater than the first. So is one given to the oxygen we're looking at just the most directly attached atom? No, every carbon is going to be attached to three atoms, right? Because carbon always has four bonds, right? When you have a double bond, that counts as two single bonds. If you have a triple bond, that counts as three single bonds. It's got nothing to do with molar mass. It's got to do with atomic number, right? So if we go back here, Okay, we just delete this here. Okay, so every carbon always has four bonds. So look at this carbon right here. I'll put it in red. One, two, three, four. This one doesn't count because it's going back towards the chiral center. So each bond in the double bond, so that each of these counts as one. So we're attached to oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. Does that give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that? Yes. Okay. So then if I look at this carbon, I'll highlight this one in blue. It's attached to four things. One, two, three, and four. I can't go back that way because that's going back towards the chiral center. That's a big no-no. So what is the carbon in blue attached to? It's attached to three hydrogens. So this carbon is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. If I look at this carbon, I'll put this one in black. What's it attached to? Four things, a carbon here, a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and then it's also attached to the chiral center. I can't go there because that's going back towards the chiral center. So it's attached to three things, carbon, hydrogen, and hydrogen. I list them in order 
of atomic numbers. So this guy's attached to carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. That's the way you do it. Does that make sense now? Does that clear up any confusion? Yes, it's about atomic number. It's got nothing to do with molar mass whatsoever. We just go by atomic number. Okay, so with that in mind, let's keep moving forward here. I talked about rotating the molecule. This is just a, um, uh, a summary of the con and gold prelog rules if you need it, if you're working through your practice problems. So with this in mind, this compound here, this is L-DOPA. DOPA, it's given to people with Parkinson's disease. Um, if you've ever wondered why can't you give somebody an injection of dopamine, that would be a lot easier than getting high on crack or something. Uh, it's because dopamine can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so that's why you can't ingest dopamine and feel good. But uh, dopa gets converted into dopamine. Anyhow, it's neither here nor there. Uh, there's one chiral center in this molecule. It's this chiral center uh, right here. Okay, so if we zoom in on that chiral center. Would this be an R stereocenter or an S stereocenter? I'll give you a second to look at it, see if anybody can come up with an answer. Anybody have an idea about this one? Let's do it together. So which, which is gonna be the highest priority group? If I highlight this, so here's my chiral center in yellow, then it's attached to, I'll highlight this carbon in blue, this carbon in red, and I'll highlight the nitrogen in green, okay? Um, and then the hydrogen is obviously the lowest priority, right? Because it's at the lowest atomic number in the whole periodic table. So which group is gonna be the highest priority? The green, red, or blue? Oh. Not the blue, it's gonna be the green, right? Because the blue is a carbon atom, right? I'm gonna put a carbon here in black. Carbon has an atomic number of six. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. So the nitrogen has to be group number one, right? And then we have two carbons. And then we've got to differentiate between the two carbons. So which carbon would be higher, higher pri priority, the one in blue or the one in red? Yes. The one in blue, because the one in blue is attached to oxygen, 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 right? You've got one, two, three bonds to oxygen. And the one in red is attached to a carbon and two hydrogens, right? So carbon, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Obviously, this is the tiebreaker here. So if I erase some of the spinach here just to clean it up a little bit. So maybe I'll put this here like that. Okay, so we have group number one. We've got group number two, we've got group number three. And so we go around the chiral center, one, two, three, like that. So that's going clockwise. The lowest priority group, which is the hydrogen is coming towards you. And so instead of being R, it's not an R compound, it's an S compound. So L-DOPA is an S compound. All right, there we go. Wunderbar, let's move on from there. So. Um, something that I was neglecting to do when I was naming those compounds, the um, S and R2 chlorobutane, is I didn't put the R and the S in brackets, and you're supposed to do that, like I have shown here. Um, so R and S go inside brackets. If you have two chiral centers, well, then you put the locant before the R or the S. So here you see that stereocenter, this is, if you number this compound, it's one, two, three, four, five, right? So this second carbon is um, R and this one here is S. So it's 2R3S is how you would label that. So you have to, if there's only one chiral center, then you don't have to give it a locant. You don't have to give it a number. It's not required in that case. All righty. So with that in mind, give me a second here. And let's try another example. Just give me two shakes of a lamb's tail. I had one pulled up here somewhere. Dee -dee -dee. Oops, having a problem with my book. Okay, so let's say we had. Bum, 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 bum. 
We had I had something here. I don't know what yet. Well, I guess I'll just have to make up a problem myself. Okay, so let's just try one more and then we'll move on. So let's say I gave you something like I don't know, something like, like this, okay? So if I gave you this compound, there's one stereo center in it. Maybe I should highlight it in yellow. There's one stereo center in this compound. Could anybody identify that stereo center as being R or S? I'll give you a second to look at it. Anybody have a feeling about this one? Yeah, absolutely. It's an S compound, right? So if I look at my groups, I have the hydrogen, which is in back. That's going to be group number four. This is going to be number one. Then if I look at this methyl group here, it's attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This one, this methylene is attached to carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. So there's my tiebreaker. This is group number two. This is group number um, three. So we go one, two, three like that. It's backwards. And the lowest priority group is going in back. And so this is an S compound. Boom. There you go. All right. So a little practice in um, in uh, in con angle of pre-log rules. Of course, you're going to need to practice that. And that brings us to my next point, which is if you have two compounds that are enantiomers, so I'll just put these two compounds in a red box here. Do you think these two compounds, would they have the same melting point or a different melting point? Do you think these two compounds would have the same or a different melting point? Yeah, it's going to be the exact same. It's going to be the same. Why? Because a melting point is based off of intermolecular forces. Right, and how are what's intermolecular forces? Intermolecular forces are based on how a molecule is going to pack with itself, right, or with another copy of itself. And so these two molecules are going to pack with themselves the exact same way. They're just mirror images of each other. So these compounds are going to have the same. So they're going to have the same melting point, uh, boiling point. They're going to have the same densities. Density. They're going to have the same flash point. They're going to have the same refractive index. I know we haven't studied refractive index, but all their physical properties are going to be the same. They're going to have the same infrared spec spectrum. They're going to have the same mass spectrum. I know we haven't looked at NMR yet, but they're going to have the same NMR. NMR. And if you're going, they're going to have the same. Has anybody here done a TLC? Maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you haven't. I don't know. But they're going to have the same TLC. Uh, so all these physical properties are identical with each other. They're going to have the same color, you know? Uh, and so how do we differentiate between the two? Uh, so it, it does, we're going to take a look at that. Okay. But it doesn't have any difference in intermolecular forces. And so they're going to have all these properties in common. So how do we differentiate between these two molecules? Well, that brings us to the next section, which deals with optical activity. If you measure what we call optical activity of these two enantiomers, so we have R carbone and S carbone here. These are really interesting compounds. Um, I forget what the two odors are of these compounds, but they have very different odors. You see that they have the same melting point, same boiling point. So um, the only way that we can differentiate between these two, there's two possibilities. One is to see how they react with other chiral compounds. That is something we don't cover in this class, so don't worry about that really. But what we're going to look at in our class is what we call their optical activity. It's, and if you're like, what do you mean by optical? Like the way they look? No, no. It's the way that they, um, the, the way that they affect what we call plane polarized light. So that's what we're going to get into in the next section. We're going to talk about what polarized light is, and we're going to talk about what, how you can differentiate between two chiral compounds or two enantiomers based on the way that they affect um, plane polarized light.
but let's take a little break first. 